Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. Welcome into the next edition of the JB and Steel Shows. We're here after a great three-point small separation Super Bowl to recap for you. We recapped an NHL trade for you in this one, too, that went down today. Also, yeah, some rumors surrounding quarterbacks like, for example, Carson Wentz in Cincinnati, plus some other stuff when Ooh. it comes to hockey, as well, like some Olympic talk as well. Um, but let's get right into it. Steel, first and foremost, how are you doing? I am doing awesome sauce, JB. How are you doing, man? How are you doing? Hey, you know, look, first of all, you guys, if you aren't following the great Professor Joe Bork, JB, uh, the main man was doing color commentating for the Reading Royals just this past Saturday. So you guys got to you got to check him out. You got to follow him. He does. He's their beat writer. He does all of their um, great information and stuff. He also covers uh, the the Phantoms for the uh, Lehigh Valley Phantoms and also the Philadelphia Flyers through Flyers Nitty Gritty. Thank you very much to them. Big time props to them. Thank you, Joe, for all the work you do for them. Also appreciate everything you do for Steel Flyers, All Sports Network. Really appreciate that, man. So thank you, guys. Hit the like and subscribe, man. Can't wait to check this out. We got some great stuff to get into tonight, man. We got Super Bowl. Got some NHL stuff going on, some hirings and some firings and some trades and some all kinds of stuff going on. Plus the fact that Super Bowl's over now as well, too. And yeah, let's get into it there. Professor, what do you think? Yeah, well, I think the Rams, the big thing with the Rams is they would have had a better – they didn't get as much credit as they probably should have for defense because – they pressured yeah. Joe Burrow. They got credit for that, but their secondary. They, I, yeah. Chris Collinsworth was picking on uh, Ramsey a little bit too much, I think, in the broadcast <clears> because <throat> the one play that he got showed up on should have been a penalty. T. Higgins gripped his face mask and threw uh, it. Yeah, I mean, hello. Got, so, like, I, I mean, I think he actually, in all in all hindsight, didn't really play too bad of a game. He did. Yeah. The play that stood out was a play that should have been called. They, they shouldn't have even had that extra touchdown. So, but it, it obviously that extra touchdown therefore set up the perfect storybook ending, which was Cooper Cup and Matthew Stafford being able when everybody on the entire planet and probably on every other planet in the universe knew they were throwing it to Cooper Cup there because Odell Beckham was injured, even yeah. though their other um, <clears throat> tight end really stepped up big Hopkins for them uh, after uh, he went out and then after Bland went out. Uh, it's still, they knew they were going to Cooper Cup. They did it. They executed. They did great. He had a touchdown earlier. And then, of course, Odell had that very good high-pointed ball by Stafford. They pressured Joe Burrow immensely great. Uh, their defense was equally as good of a reason why they won this game as it was Matthew Stafford and uh, mm -hmm. and Cooper Cup, who, by the way, did something Jerry Royce did in his entire career in one season, which was win the Offensive Player of the Year, the Triple Crown. And the Super Bowl MVP. It took Jerry Rice's entire NFL career to do that. Cooper Cup did that in one NFL season. I mean, geez. Uh, okay. I also agree with you 100%. With the additions that the Rams did um, throughout the season by bringing Odell in. Now, I'm, I be, I'm reading now that, that they're believing that he has a torn ACL, potentially. Uh, he did mess up that, that knee before. I forget if it was a whole blown ACL, if it was just an injured ACL before, but he did mess up that knee in some degree before. Yeah. Can't yeah. remember to what extent, though. Yeah. So I think that's what's going on with that. At least that's what I'm reading right now. The addition of Von Miller, the with Aaron Donald and then – also, see, that's what I mean. I believed, and we talked about this before we were on air, where I believe that the Rams defense cupped with Cooper Cup <laughs> and Stafford et al. was a much better matchup over Cincinnati than Cincinnati was over the Rams. I felt that Cincinnati had the magical season, but... Um, I didn't feel they had enough uh, to go up against um, the Rams because I felt the Rams defense was going to be too much for the banged up offensive line for Cincinnati. 
and 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 I just and that's kind of basically what happened. I mean, Burrow was sacked a few times, and and the defense played surprisingly well to the point where their secondary was able to hold Cincinnati to only twenty points. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, even the Chiefs well, couldn't Zach do that. Taylor, Zach Taylor said it himself in the first half. The protection was I can't remember the exact quote, but it was okay. And then the second half, it, it, paraphrasing, it kind of just fell apart. And that's right. when Joe Burrow was getting shellacked, obviously against the Titans. I think he got sacked nine times, but they still won the game. Yes, so he yes. finds a will and a way to do it most of the time. But then we have both quarterbacks here, one playing through an ankle injury he got during the game or a foot injury, whatever one. And I think it was yeah. whatever. That yeah, I saw him live And then the there. other uh, playing through a right knee injury that he got in Joe Burrow. So you had two guys worrying, uh, being warriors and fighting it out to the end. Um, and then it just became the MVP of offense in Cooper Cup, along with the uh, quarterback that got it done in the end. He was solid throughout the game, but then great in the biggest moment, Matthew Stafford. And then the MVP of the defense, Aaron Donald. Those would be the three stars of the game that really got it done in the end. And then you have to applaud that Hopkins kid yeah. of being able to step in in the Super Bowl. There always seems to be that uh, unexpected star. It was like Corey Clement for the Eagles. You never expected that. There always seems to be that unexpected dude. He wasn't even really supposed to be in the game, but Bland never got injured blocking. He didn't even get a chance to get in the uh, passing game a little bit. Hopkins comes in. Uh, Bryson Hopkins uh, plays immensely well. Uh, was drafted in the fourth round only in 2020, so maybe this is a coming out party and a thing for him to be able to get his name out there and uh, be on the radar more for the Rams coaches, Sean McVay and company. Uh, going into next season because obviously yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that's huge for him. And then Akers, who had a poor game, had a, one of the most important plays on that second down run when they were able to pick it up where the Rams, I felt, probably ran too much because that's not them. But then they were able to pick it up on one of the most pivotal times of the game. So, See, that's the thing where I think the two key things here is is what stands out to the most here to me. Is Stafford was 26 of 46 for 350 some odd yards, but three touchdowns, right? And no interceptions. So he had a solid game. And then you look on the other side of the ball where Cincinnati is known for their running and they had 26 attempts for 56 yards. So that shows you that, you know, the Rams basically made Cincinnati one dimensional. They took away their running game where Cincinnati was able to run the ball up and down all day up on the Chiefs. And, and they had good success against other, the other teams in the playoffs as well. Too. And that was one of the things that got Cincinnati to where they were as their running game. You know, but they weren't yeah, really able they had to 79 total yards. rushing. 79 total yards. Best, yeah. Four for Chase, three for Burrow, and then P. Ryan didn't have any with two rushes. Uh, okay, but that uh, so. that's still not a Cincinnati game. Their game is rushing multiple, you know. Yeah, Joe Mixon had the most first down runs of anybody in football this entire that's, and They uh, like start the tempo running, and then they open up the field that way, like you were saying, and then they get the and then they get it going with Joe Burrow uh, slinging it around, right? Exactly. It out to P. Higgins, Jamar Chase. And uh, everybody, uh, Azuma there and everybody else and Tyler Boyd. Uh, exactly. Get the run in. game sets up the passing game for Cincinnati. And the Rams defense took that away from Cincinnati and made Cincinnati one-dimensional. That's why Cincinnati wasn't able to win this game. That's that's kind of where I'm at on that. And, you know. Yeah, and that's also why the Rams were able to blitz better because they were yeah. able to shut down the running game. Henceforth, they were passing more, so then they were able to – Catch them up, pin your ears back, and just go. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, but I think uh, we about wrapped up that uh, great battle to the end. Yeah, man, congratulations to the Rams, though, man. Congratulations to Matthew Stafford for getting out of the turmoil. Yeah, buddy, and uh, going to the Rams and being able to get it done. Uh, Odell Beckham, even though he got injured, still had a good first quarter, got the Super Bowl ring. He has a kid coming soon, so good for him. Um, Van Jefferson had a kid after the game. so his, Yeah, I saw so, that like three right, hours later, was in the hospital. Yeah. And then uh, one of their safeties, I'm blanking on his name right now, but he got married as he proposed on the field. 
after oh, the Oh, wait, I just saw it. Hold on. For the Rams. Hold on. I just saw it. I just saw it. Uh, Tyler Rapp uh, yeah, proposes yeah. to girlfriend Danny Johnson right at the Super Bowl there, uh, right on the field. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, so all, all good things for the L.A. Rams in the Super Bowl. And once the Bengals, the Bengals got here before ahead of schedule. So they're going to be back here. My one friend that's a Bengals fan, I texted him this earlier today. You're going to be back here because once you build up that offensive line, you're going to be one of the favorites if you can keep the other stuff around the team that's there now. Because you just have to build up the protection around Joe Burrow because he's already ridiculous with having one of the worst offensive lines. Imagine how good he's going to be when he actually has more time to throw the ball. So, oh, my gosh. Or, <laughs> or the fact that – if they have a, a much better um, offensive line, now they're opening up way more holes in the in the ground game that will allow him to be that play action type um, option type passer, which is what he was known for. Do you know what I mean? And that plays to his strength. So I really think I agree with you there on that one, Pro Joe. I really think that Cincinnati definitely has a chance to be back. They need to shore up their offensive line, and I think they need to shore up their defense um, a little bit more to bolster their defense a little bit more. Yeah, and you need it, to get somebody to replace Eli Apple on the outside. He's just he's a backup corner. He's not a guy that should be start, in getting starting reps. Yeah. And as long as Cincinnati can can beat the dogs in the AFC, a la Pittsburgh, a la the Ravens, and it looks like now with Roethlisberger retired – it looks like the reins now are going to be passed to a team like Cincinnati, at least yeah. for the next couple seasons, because I don't really see football. Pittsburgh doing anything groundbreaking yeah, or shattering to change that. Yeah, you would have to have one of the rookies come in and play really well, take a chance on Carson Wentz and have him play great for you, uh, which would also have to have the caveat of him staying on the field health-wise. Um, and the, or take a chance on if the, um, I must say the Titans, uh, if the Vikings are done with Kirk Cousins and ready to move on, uh, take a chance on Kirk Cousins since he's kind of a strong arm armor guy, similar to Big Ben at well, one time that can chuck it down the field. Oh, but Kirk, the one thing about Kirk Cousins, he's not the best quarterback, but the one thing he's usually he's graded at manager. doing. Well, that, but he's also usually one of the higher graded deep throwers. So if you have guys like Juju that can speed it, you have uh, guys like, um, what's the other guy's name that's the, that's your really fast receiver? Oh, Dante Johnson. Yeah, yeah, Johnson. Thank you. That can really Chase be Claypool. like Chase down Claypool. the field. Chase yeah, Claypool. Claypool's more of an all around guy for me. Well, here's the problem, good. though, right? Here's the problem. Okay, so Juju probably ain't going to be back. He's a free agent. That's a good point. So you have Claypool. You got Johnson, and then is it Washington, the other guy? Yes, James Washington. That's, yeah, James Washington. That's a cool. So I think he might fit in better there because he already is – like you have J.J. who's a great all-around wide receiver, but if you look at the tight – or not the tight, the Vikings, they have feel, and he was already doing good there. If you can have guys that are deep threats, maybe he can ex, ex, um, kind of expose well, that. He usually is one of the better graded. With deep Pittsburgh deep. now with two... And I'm not even the biggest. I think Kirk Cousins is like a – just because of the way the like his stats are, and we have to wait for these young guys to prove themselves, that'll probably be ahead of him in a couple. Of years. But right now, somewhere, uh, around- he's not going to be. I don't think he's going to be the quarterback that's going to fit into the Matt Canada offense. See what the Matt Canada offense needs to run successfully is a quarterback that is able to be mobile. Uh, for one, and able to do a lot of rollouts and a lot of pitches, okay, uh, because that is the basis of the Matt Canada offense, where he has a lot of jet sweeps and he has a lot of jet motions, um, and you need they a quarterback. They don't do that, but the uh, Vikings did run. I mean, he runs play actions all right. And most people okay, but, I mean, Zimmer Ben could do that too when they let him, you know. Yeah. Zimmer but, also wasn't obviously the best head coach for quarter. Right, so. right. You know, so that's kind of the other thing, too, where you need to get a guy that's going to be able to fit into the Matt Canada offense, a quarterback that's going to be well, able that to do Wentz that. Wentz would actually do that more than um, – just, just just not not from necessarily how – All right, played. if I had my ways and means, from, from, I would try to have play, Russell Wilson. From player baseline, Carson Wentz compared to – 
Well, yeah, that's if uh, everything works out perfectly. But Carson Wentz, I'm saying, compared to Kirk Cousins from what you're saying, he can roll out of the pocket. He has done those option plays when he was with the Eagles. But I got to be honest so, with you, though, Pro Joe, if I had my druthers, I'd much rather just go with Mason Rudolph than, than either one of those two guys, to be honest with you. Carson Wentz or... or the problem with me, I don't think Mace can, like, Mason Rudolph's speed is Big Ben's speed at retirement. <laughs> Mason Rudolph's problem is this, okay? <laughs> I have seen enough of Mason Rudolph that I can tell you exactly what's going on with Mason Rudolph. Mason Rudolph has all the tools. He has the size. He has the arm, okay? He lacks a little bit of accuracy, but I think that would come with reps. Here's the thing that Mason Rudolph doesn't have. See, there's a little clock that needs to run in your head, right, especially as a quarterback. And when you drop back to pass, you need to be able to go two, three. The ball needs to be gone by then because otherwise you're going to be – He holds the ball. Yeah, he's one of those guys that holds it too long. I he, he has no he has no timing. He has – the only thing I've been able to see him do is he's a hot read. All the way through college – all the way through everything that he's done so far is he's been the hot read, and that's the only thing he's been able to complete. I, I kid you not, in the game against no, Detroit, he threw the ball 56 times, and the only re completions that he had for 89% of those completions was the hot read. Only on less than 16% of those completions were to somebody else. Oh, yeah. Well, he would be better if he could um... – do that stuff, but the other thing is all the things you were saying, Matt Canada once. That's why I brought up Kirk Cousins because Kirk Cousins can no, move. No, no, I get Mason you, Rudolph, I get you, but, but Mason Rudolph doesn't move at all. He's right. a completely pocket stationary yeah. quarterback. That, that, that Cousins that has a little bit more mobility. I'm all. with you. Kirk Cousins can at least skate a little bit from side to side on play action. <laughs> like Mason yeah, Rudolph I agree. Play yeah. action plays pretty much running the play action, pulling up and throwing the damn ball because he's yeah, not rolling you. too far out this way. So, otherwise, Aaron Donald or any other great defender, uh, Griffin, anybody else is just going to tackle. So, I mean, that's what you have to have, I think, for Rudolph, even if he gets that going. The only way Mason Rudolph is going to be really successful is with one of the top O lines because of the way that blitzers are nowadays. You don't have those 385-pound guys that bulldoze and are slower. You have the, these freakish athletic uh, Clowny guys that when he was in the league, that was kind of like, oh my God, Davian Clowney. Now there's like not so many of them because that's an over exaggeration, but there's a good few of those freakishly athletic defenders like Leonard, even with the um, Rams that, that played really well. He got banged up a bit yeah. yesterday, but like you have all these guys, Khalil Mack that can slide up and down, Mika Parsons of the world. So, I mean, obviously, I think in order for Mason Rudolph to be successful, you're going to have to have a tremendously good offensive line and probably one of the top five in the, in the league. And that is not the case <laughs> in uh -huh. Pittsburgh. That is just not the case. You know what I mean? Um, TJ Watt. You have to be the Tony Romo effect of that height. One, two. You and, see, and, that's, and, see, and that's two, why two. Ben was so successful, because he was able to get rid of the ball so quickly. And he was able to survey the field much quicker and make decisions much faster OK, than any of the other quarterbacks on the team at the time. OK, so that's kind of the thing where you need to be able to get rid of the ball quick. I, I don't know. I mean, what? quite honestly, quite honestly, I, I still wish that Alex Smith was still playing because I really think he would be the perfect quarterback that would be able to run this offense of Matt Canada. He, he would be rid. able to. Quickly. Huh? Uh, he did. He was a get rid of the ball quick guy that could move around the pocket, run a little bit. Yeah. So that that did fit into what you were saying. Yeah, that would make that would make sense. That's why Carson Wentz, the idea of the player he is. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I get player. it. The problem is he's not that successful anymore in what he once was. So right. like you would have to <laughs> have him perform more consistently at the at, at Yeah, that would be yeah. <laughs> and also play more consistently on the field, not injury-wise. But let's turn now the tie from football. I talked about the Super Bowl and something going on with Steelers, Pittsburgh Steelers, to hockey, where we have Jack Eichel 
returning for the Vegas Golden Knights. Before we get into the trade, we'll get to the Jack Eichel news. Jack Eichel returning for the, well, well, technically debuting for the Vegas Golden Knights, returning to the NHL back from his injury, which is going to be on Wednesday. Obviously, he's added into a team that's right there. They, uh, you're kidding. Wait, no. Okay, yeah, no, I'm seeing it right now. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, breaking he's news, news, breaking news. And he uh, and obviously they this is a perfect time because one Mark Stern's on L Mark Stone, excuse me, is on LTI. Yeah, yeah. Part of that's for cap reasons, probably. And then the other reason is they have Calgary right on their coattails. So this is a great time for him to come back. They already have Pacioretty playing ridiculous. They have him slotted in with Eichel, Pacioretty, and then the uh, the guy that's the uh, silky old veteran of Kenny the Dan off there. And then you already have, obviously, Riley Smith. You might end up getting moved, but he's playing great. You got Jan Mark, you got Carlson, Marshall, Stevenson. Roy. Like, the, obviously, we know this team, basically, to sum it up, is, is riddled with depth. And now they're adding one of the best players when he's healthy in the entire league, scoring output-wise. A bigger dude at 203, obviously, 6'2", that moves like the wind. He's going to take him a little bit to get his skating legs back, but... We've seen guys yeah. at his talent level, like Stamkos, when he wasn't even healthy, and and then got and then went out right after, uh, in in the Stanley Cup playoffs score uh, with a sports hernia. You've seen guys at his level when they're able to come back. Crosby off of COVID didn't look like the same speed of Cindy Crosby, but was able to find ways to get it done still until he got the speed back. Guys at this level are typically just able to find ways until they get the speed fully back to exactly. still get it done and and produce in some way in some capacity. Wow. Man, I mean, I, the last I saw, he was projected to be March. That when he would be coming back to considering playing games in March. So this is amazing. And I'll tell you what, I hope and pray, honestly, uh, that this works out for him. I, I really do. Because this could have such a ripple effect in the NHL, because now this procedure now would then be proven successful to a hockey player. And and Eichel would be the first hockey player to get this procedure done successfully and then continue to play. OK, um, so that would be another big step in, in that direction. Um, the fact that he would a would be able to get this procedure and then play. I mean, come on, man. That's incredible. I mean, you, you, sure. And you're right. If Vegas, are you kidding? You, Jack Eichel on Vegas? Oh my gosh, man! Look, they, they, and you're right. Calgary is one point back, and then you got <laughs> L.A. and Anaheim are both only Cali four teams. points back. Yeah. The two Cali teams. Out of the you two know, out of the so five. I mean, come on, this is going to be tough in the Pacific, and Vegas needs all the help they can get. Okay. They truly do, because you're exactly right. Calgary has been banging on the door, and they've been playing exceptionally well. Uh, Vegas also has had the issue of uh, Robin Leonard, uh, um, of course, has had a couple injuries this year. He's played in 34 of their games. Uh, yeah. Warren so stepped up for them. Thompson didn't have as good of a first game this year as he did when he debuted last year. Um, so Exactly. Uh, but, th but that's one game, so I don't have think anything of I mean, that. You know, yeah. Yeah, they they got the, the the thing with Vegas is they'll probably end up if they do end up having to move Riley Smith just because they they haven't made a move yet really in their existence that you've looked at and go what the heck is it where they'll probably end up getting like That's even true. if they have to get rid of him for cap you'll be like oh how did they get this prospect back for Riley Smith and, and then they'll end up getting somebody that's better than you thought they would have got and then they'll just slot him into their third line and then you'll be like oh cool they have the like 160th ranked prospect or whatever in, in their third line now that's just going to continue to develop now and, and be like Vegas always seems to find a will and a way so I wouldn't be surprised if they even find another way and then they also have Alex Martinez who's always been an underrated defenseman who's been back of a player who's, yeah he's going to be coming back White Cloud hasn't been in every game this year so yeah, he'll be he back at some point so those guys are a big impact to their defense that haven't been in every game either so exactly but like we said, Calgary's on the come. LA's on the come. Anaheim's on the come, too. You know what I mean? So Vegas needs all the help they can get. Now, the only 
of all the moves Vegas has done, the only one I'm scratching my head on is the Nolan Patrick move. I think that was just what the heck. Like, we, we, we have the room to do it. Like, that was one of those he has potential, let's just do it for the heck of it type. Okay. I mean, I was just – I'm just sitting here thinking. I mean, like you said that of all the moves Vegas has made, and I'm thinking – Wait a minute. There's one move that I'm a little bit scratching my head on, and that's. And the, who do they move? And then uh, they moved. Um, because wasn't that the three team trade when we did the Patrick? Yes. Nashville, yeah. 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 So I mean, okay. Also, he actually hasn't. Speaking of somebody that they've just thrown into a bottom row of the he actually hasn't looked bad on their fourth line. Who Patrick? He, yeah, he has. Yeah, he no, has, yeah, I've seen him. Yeah, yeah. On the fourth, where. I think that's just really what they went. Well, this is going to be a guy that was a former second overall pick. We're going to give him no pressure. We don't need him in the top three lines. We'll yeah. let him develop on the fourth yeah. line. Yeah. He already has seven points, I think it is, in like, yeah, six points in 17 games. So he's doing good fourth line production at point three five points per game, work his way up from there. And then um, and then he'll continue to get better now away from the pressure of being the second overall pick because, of course, once you go to a new team, at least in my opinion, that kind of falls away from you because yeah, you're I agree. a new team and a new yeah. set. Yeah, so. no, I agree. I agree with you 100%. I mean, a change of scenery is always sometimes a good thing for a player. I, like I said, I wasn't trying to ram uh, Nolan Patrick out of town or anything like that, but his situation was becoming a liability in Philadelphia. Okay, and he wasn't able to be available enough to play at the level that Philadelphia needed a second overall first round pick to play. No, but I think also a lot of that goes with, he had an unforeseen like head condition you can't foresee. And then also Danny Breer said it when he got hired, we have to do better at developing uh, going forward with our team. So that, that, that plays into that as well. Well, I think the fact that he had core muscle injury surgery before he was even drafted should have been a bloody red flag, but hey, what do I know? Yeah, I think it was just in that draft they were kind of you did have McCarr, but everybody goes back, and then whenever you listen to like this, uh, well, TSN, or, uh, um, TSN and uh, sports now, like the Freedmans of the world, uh, the Sams of the world, like I, I think, um, it, it, it comes down to McCarr was ranked more fourth through seven, like anywhere low, a little bit lower. He wasn't ranked in the top two. So you could have but picked But there was him. other players, though, Joe, but, that but were. It was, oh, yeah, but that was an understandable draft of going into that draft. People knew what the one-two was. Nobody expected the one-two not to be Patrick or Heischer. That's kind of what everybody, every analyst. Yeah, every well, analyst said. when you. It, it, just because it didn't work out doesn't mean. Well, uh, I think we can say that draft. In like hindsight, you can say they picked wrong, but at the moment, everybody thought whoever didn't go first out of those two was going to get picked second. And then at the same time, Nico, he's sure he's the captain now. He's continuing to develop, but th he hasn't even been as good as some of the no, other. No, no, I'm with you. Well, I'm with you. I agree. I agree. I'm with you. Um, but I'll tell you what now. Uh, uh, we do have there was there was uh, a lot of stuff happened uh, where Montreal hired <laughs> Martin Saint Louis. <laughs> yeah, that's a that that's fired one, Ducharme. And that's when Pirlo and I said he uh, he doesn't pull any punches. Saint Louis, he's obviously going to keep it honest. He's probably going to be there to kind of revamp the locker room, uh, <clears throat> bring yeah. it back, uh, kind of get everybody's energy going in the right direction. Yeah. And the move they made the day to bring in Tyler Pitlick trading to Foley is a perfect example of that. Where they also, excuse me, got a first round pick and a fifth round pick. Yeah, plus, fifth round. Uh, yeah, plus Heineman. Um, who's yeah, in Emil Heineman. I'll tell you what. Uh, he's well. played. He's played twenty six games. He's got uh, what eleven yeah, goals, played, seventeen he's points. Played over, he's played over in Sweden, and he's been yeah, playing. men. I mean, he's a 20-year-old playing against men, but he's got he, 11 goals. 
Yeah, 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 I think so. Yeah, I don't remember his exact stats. I'm, I'm, yeah, I think he's got eleven goals and and eight or nine assists, or seven or eight or nine assists. I know he's doing well because he's more of a goal scorer. I think like a develop, like he's going to get the points, goals, and assists. But I think could be a good scorer and at least a top nine level. And then that's what I said when I did the video on him. And then, well, not on him, but on the entire trade. And then uh, it'll go from there because he's one of those prospects that I think people forget about because he was a very high-ranked second-round pick. It's just they forget about him a little bit because he's already moved twice. He was part of the trade, that, that, that the Sam Bennett trade, and now he's part of this trade to get Tyler Toffoli. And that, that's no knock on him. It's just they're trying to get these trades to help these respective teams out. So uh, that's all it is. He'll come over from Sweden. He'll probably be a good guy. Tyler Pitt looks a perfect guy to have in a rebuilding situation because we know that from his time here. Even if he's only going to score in the team's points per season, he's one of those so guys that right. brings the right energy every night, no matter yeah. what, no matter yeah. how big or how good your team's doing, he's always going to bring the right energy. And those are the perfect guys to have in a rebuilding. Exactly. Team. Kind of grab certain guys by the coattails and say, you got to do what this guy's doing. Exactly. I mean, he plays the game the right way every night. You know what I mean? So I, I am, I rue the day that the Flyers had to let go. Of I feel like Elliot or not Elliot. Um, I meant um, St. Louis might have part to do with um, bringing in someone like Pitlick. Cause that seems like Pirlo and I um, talked about that a little bit where I think he was got banged up on Thursday, but it should have been, I don't think it'll be anything too long for Pitlick, but like St. Louis is one of those guys that's going to try to get like these guys to just at least first and foremost, start playing the right way, playing with like how the Flyers sucked in the first game against Detroit. And then the second game they lost this weekend on Saturday, at least it looked like they gave a damn and were giving effort. Like they like, he wants I'll to, have to that. agree with you on he that wants one. To see that of, with the Canadians where it looked like they kind of put things in cruise control, similar to how Philly has. Most oh of man, they look like they were phoning it in. So like getting someone like Pitt, like I wouldn't be surprised if St. Louis even was like one of the guys involved in that going, this is a perfect guy to just show play like him. I am so with you on that, man, for sure. Um, I, don't even disagree with that at all. Um, I'm very interested to see how that's going to work. Um, he has no prior coaching experience um, at all. So, I mean, we'll see how that's going to work. I mean, I think he's got a good leadership core up there uh, in Montreal that they'll be able to take the, him under their wing and kind of help him along. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, I'm sure he's got a lot of great ideas and stuff. I mean, it's like the first time that Rod Brindamore was given the opportunity to coach. You know, everybody was like, yeah, what kind of a coach is Rod Brindamore going to be? Well, he's a Jack Adams award winning coach. How's that for you? Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see if St. Louis is more of one of those fix the culture guys or a guy that they actually expect to be the long foreseeable because – Pirlo seems to think he's more of one of those just come and fix the culture guy. Yeah. Uh, I could see it being that, but I could also see him being a guy that they expect to kind of develop as the team grows because he doesn't have coaching experience. Sometimes that would be the right guy to bring in as the team grows and kind of make him the new Jeff Blaschel, have trust in one guy and go, we don't care if you don't have the best overall record. We're not looking at that. We're looking at how you develop guys and how you bring the, the, the right system in to what we want to see. And then we're just going to bring the talent into what you're doing. And then we'll get better that way gradually each season. Well, that's kind exactly. of what the Red Wings did. Where when you look, he's the second most tenured coach. And nobody would think Jeff Blashill is the yeah. second most tenured, yeah, tenured, right? like, who? tenured coach. So, um, like, that's because the Red Wings, before it was uh, Ken Holland, and now it's obviously Stevie Y, that bought in on saying, well, he just knows how to coach. It's just we haven't had the guys around him to get it done record-wise but he has developed some of the young guys. We've seen the inroads we want to see. Certain guys like the Zadinas, that's just because he hasn't been – Is his awareness on the ice isn't always the best, yet where it's got better this season, and that's when you sort of seeing it developing. That's not really coaching. That's more a player that has to develop more. He has the skill. Now it's about being in the right spots on each end. So See, that's kind of how I look at Rob Brindamore, too. I think he's not only the, the type of coach that can change the culture, but he's also that type of coach that's going to stick around for the long haul because he's going to be able to develop players. 
Do you know what I mean? He's going to be able to teach them how to play the game the right way. He's going to be able to teach him how to play in the penalty kill. He's going to be able to teach him how to be, you know, defensively responsible, even though you're a winger. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, he's just that because that's the kind of player he was. And naturally, now that we've seen him coach now for the last couple of years, that's the kind of coach he is, too. You know what I mean? So I. I just I'm interested to see how this whole thing's going to shake down, and I do agree with you, Joe. I think that St. Louis had something to do with bringing Pitlick to Montreal, and this whole Toffoli trade um, went down because I think there was some things that Montreal saw and what they wanted to do, and 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 I do agree with you. I think St. Louis spoke up and said something as to why this trade went down and happened. Yeah. No, no, I, I do agree with that. And also, I think, speaking of Ken Holland, a smart move by Ken Holland as you move on to a different coach that got fired and another one that got promoted uh, was Dave Tippett uh, <laughs> being let go by the Edmonton Oilers and uh, having uh, Jay Woodcroft uh, from, and his assistant get promoted. Yeah, from um, the minors. Mm-hmm. From, yeah, the Bakersfield Condors where he – was doing a great job with the Seth Griffiths, the Cooper Moralities, and others, yeah. the Malones of the world. Everybody was doing good down there, uh, even performing beyond expectations. They were, oh yeah, of uh, doing really well. You need to be in the top six in your division to be um, in the postseason. They were in third, playing extremely well above expectations. So Woodcroft, I think, is a perfect guy because he really knows how to get the most, especially on the offensive end of the puck, out of guys. And obviously with Edmonton, well, obviously that's what they're trying to uh, have done there, uh, get a little bit more off depth offense out of these guys. Now, Jesse Pujarvi, he has been giving that to them this season. Yeah. He's coming back from overseas. But you have some other guys. Yamamoto has been struggling. Um, obviously, Vander Kane's been finding his first handful of games. Derek Ryan is really just a fourth liner. Benson now, I think, because he has the experience with Woodcroft, played well with him with the Condors, that's going to be great for him to get going. Uh, Ryan McLeod's already been good. It'll probably even be better with Woodcroft because that's his coach from the Condors. So I think he has a lot of these guys. He has familiarity with them. Broberg, I think, will probably start playing his best hockey. Uh, Stuart Skinner, even, because he knows how to make what ticks with him more than Dave Tippett does. Obviously, he had him with uh, Bakersfield the last couple of years. I think it's going to help all these guys to really get ticking fully in the right direction where they are battling to get back in the playoffs, but he's going to give them a better chance. But the problem is, like Pirlo and I said, you can't coach what's not there. So they still need to add probably another guy that can bring more offense. To Foley would have been a good guy. He's off the board to your rival across in Alberta. So you pro- you need to add other people that can add to the scoring there, and you need to add another defender probably and somehow fit that in your cap. And maybe even a middle cap tier goaltender. So there's different things you need to add because Woodcroft's going to be able to pull stuff out of guys that have been underperforming, I do believe. But they just don't have enough on that defense. Like Pirlo said, it's suspect to say the least. And I completely agree with that. And also Mike Smith's having a poor year. Miko Koskinen is just a backup goaltender. And so, then Stuart Skinner's really your best option in net. Yeah. He doesn't have any experience yet. So exactly. that's not so, I mean, that's why I think he can't coach what's not there. But in terms of getting the most out of the guys that I think have been underperforming or have been performing up to par and even getting more out of them, I think he will do that because he knows what makes them tick, especially the guys Tippett has been using wrong, like the Bensons of the world and the Brobergs of the world um, and okay. uh, the Linens of the world. Well- like th- those guys, I think, could put in the right spots rather than what Dave Tippett has been doing. So let me ask this question, right? So how long has Ken Holland been the general manager up there in Edmonton? Longer Not than that seven way. years? Uh, five it, years? It might be five. I don't think it's seven. He's been there five years? No, I would have to look that up. I don't All know. right. Well, here's my point, okay? Um, the fact that you – did not change your goaltending from last year to this year. And that was clearly one of the things that completely let you down in the playoffs the previous season. And you looked at that room. fired only in 20. Yeah, I didn't think it was that long ago. It was only 2019. Okay. And you looked at that room and went, yeah, everything's still good in that room. 
and expected to put this team out on the ice and expected them to win games now against the full NHL. I mean, I well, I, just, Pirlo I don't has, get uh, it. Pirlo said with Edmonton, you're, it, it's a lot. It's similar a little bit to Philly, where the top down effect isn't the best. Where Holland might have been strapped financially by the owner. He might have might have said, "You can do X, Y, and Z. You can't go beyond X, Y, and Z." And if you, so, Flurry, for example, isn't a he isn't a mid tier cap hit. He's a decent goaltender cap hit. So maybe. So that they they could still do that now, but but they're also paying but, them after the season. So uh, but, if they do it, that that's still an economical decision at this point because they would pay them for half the season. Yeah, well, economics aside, which I believe they failed on that because let's face it, their goaltending is what's letting them down. They didn't do enough defensively. They didn't add enough pieces defensively. They don't have anything else other he than... He was also put in a bad spot. I'm trying to remember who their GM was because the the guy you're trying to blame, Pirlo and I blanked on his name too. Um, okay. Well, I'm just trying to think of it before Holland in 19. Kind of like... Because Co- was, Holland's like, only been there since 19, yeah, you said, yeah, right? Yeah, he's kind of he was kind of left in a, a bad spot. All uh, right, well, all uh, right, well... Okay. That, that where then he brought in Mike Smith, who of course had one of his best seasons last year. So he was I banking agree, on but... I think cap wise that working out, and then Stuart Skinner doing what he's doing this year, which is ascending, and then Koskinen at least being a decent tier backup. But uh, after having a decent start to the year, uh, when he had to step up, Koskinen has fallen off again. So. But didn't they go out and? I mean, uh, well, you know, hey. I think it was more um, – Pirlo also said it. Edmonton's not – like, like they, the, the way they probably got Duncan Keith, he said, which I didn't know, is because he's fairly close to his family now in Edmonton. So it's only like a plane, a short plane ride away. It's not, where Other than that, like if, if you're on towards the other side of Canada and you're towards Ontario, most people he said are going to want to go to like – they can't go to Toronto. They probably want to go to the Jet. So, like, if you're going back to Canada, Edmonton's not going to be your first choice. Uh, uh, right. Where, where yeah. um, Duncan Keith, he had more connections there. The, the, that kind of played into that. Yeah. Uh, Zach Hyman yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, could have probably, I guess, went to the fact of, well, I want to play in McDavid. And that, that probably had a lot to do with it. So, like, you have that effect. But the fact is Edmonton, according to uh, – Pirlo isn't the most lively city, so that that plays into it. And I think uh, you have to get what you can get. And obviously, Evander Kane fell into their hands. And I also think having a guy like Woodcroft compared to Tippett uh, for a guy that's obviously an offensive uh, wizard uh, will help. Uh, that 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 um, yeah, well, of Evander well, Kane as well as everybody else around him. Fogel has been underperforming on both ends of the puck. I think having yeah. a new voice in there can help somebody like him. As well as obviously to be said with Yamamoto as well. Well, Peyton on the radio, uh, by the way, if y'all ain't got to check him out too, man. They do live streams as well with uh, Perlo does uh, color and Peyton does play by play. But Peyton even said on his shows too that he really likes Woodcroft and feels that he's going to be, he's a good young coach with a good new voice in the room. Yeah, he's only in his mid 40s. Yeah, so he likes this coach. So I tend to, to side with guys who lean it because that's their city. And that's, you know, if, if he likes that coach, then I'm going to go with that. You know what I mean? So he's one I, of the more, well, was one of the more impressive. Now was one of the more impressive AHL coaches with Bakersfield. Uh, yeah. Now that yeah. That's, see, that's the thing. So uh, yeah. that, that was a good signing. And then also we talked about it from the Canadians perspective. Um, I think obviously getting Tyler to Foley from the, um, Flames' perspective is a huge pickup because that adds depth scoring. Uh, wow. When I looked at it earlier, they had him down on the third line with Dylan Dubé, and I believe it was Sean Monaghan uh, were the projections because they kept Coleman on the second. So that gives you – yeah, Dubé and Monaghan. So that gives you wow. a lot of depth scoring in your first three. Bachlin's, uh, at, uh he's in – and is in the second line. You got Coleman – there with him and Mangiapane on the second line. Kachuk, Limblom. Yeah, I like that Mangiapane uh, line. Yeah, and then also Milan Lucic is actually playing half decent. Yeah, yeah. So that, Adam Ruzica um, has filled in fine as a uh, youngster, 22-year-old that was drafted in 2017 uh, as a fourth-line center um, when there's been injuries this year. So 
uh, they basically have had that step up mentality, next man up whenever needed, which hasn't been as much as other teams. And now they add another great player in uh, Tyler Toffoli, who's one of the more productive uh, snipers in the league, uh, who's at 0.7 points per game. Uh, with a team that obviously isn't the best offensively, comes to a much better team offensively. But they did want that scoring still in that top nine. They get that with a straight sniper. So I think I think this is a very uh, for for the Calgary Flames to add with obviously Vladar, Markstrom, and Net. Their defense that continues to get better as the season on goes, and then uh, Majipani and others continuing to grow. Obviously, Dylan Dubay I think is a fairly a solid. Um, bottom nine, uh, bottom six player, top nine player, the way you want to put that as well. So uh, they, they have it filled out now, and he just makes their lines even sweeter. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they add one more defenseman since they have that Zadorov on Gabranson pair, and they are playing well. Um, but, like, maybe they would have one more just veteran, not like one of those big-name defensemen, but just a veteran that's been there, done that on the market. I wouldn't be shocked if that's the case, but th- their team pretty well set up right now, that's for sure. So I was just checking to see what was going on here, just to see if he's already uh, with the Canadians, so he's not going to have to worry about. He's still going to have to follow protocol, though, right, to to be on the team, even though he doesn't have to worry about travel restrictions. Or anything well, I don't know like. how that works because you only test symptomatic people now, so I don't. I, I, I don't have right. to think that. I wouldn't think that would be different. Uh, okay, I was just checking. You got traded, yeah. So I mean, he's coming as- from Montreal to Calgary, so it's not like he's going from Canada to the United States or going from the United yeah, States I don't know to Canada. For trades, but I know in general they're only testing the symptomatic right. people. Right. So right. if it okay. goes like that with trades, the only way he would then have he to, should be able to play whenever he gets yeah, up the there. The only way he would then have to do that is if he feels anything coming in. So exactly. Okay. Well, cool. I think it's a great move. I think it shows that. Calgary is taking the steps that they need to take in order to cross that finish line at a much higher um, position than their rivals. And I don't know, man. I, I'm excited. I have been very excited about some of the off teams this year, like Florida, the Calgary, like Anaheim slash LA. Both, both, Florida, or both uh, California teams. I mean, yeah. Yeah, you know it, what I mean? And then even the third one in San Jose is still in the wild card race, uh, which nobody expected that. And then, oh, and then the Darlings, right? For me, the Darlings are Minnesota. Yeah, that was the team that I was kind of like. Oh, yeah, I was the So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, see, and then at? I think um, I think a good way to wrap up with hockey, since we're also on the Flames right now, one of the for the first star of the week was Flames goaltender Jacob Markstrom, who stopped 93 of 97 shots, uh, face for the week to continue uh, his ridiculous season. Uh, Markstrom earned his league-leading eighth shutout of 21-22, four more than any other goaltender and two shy of the single-season franchise record established by none other than Miko Kiprasov um, in 2005-2006, which was 10 shutouts. Um, and uh, Kiprasov was a um, pretty exciting with a cool old-school playing uh, goal yeah, yeah. back in the day. That, that that was one of their best in franchise history in my lifetime. Well, actually, probably the best in my He was the best goaltender in my lifetime. Um, that was that was one of the best. I'd like to see the I'd like to see the big guy. Yeah, and then the second star was Patrick Line, who the Blue Jackets could potentially flip again, uh, perfectly getting going at the right time. Uh, he collected three goals, three assists in three games for six points. So moving in the right direction. And then Nico Hishu was the first overall pick of the aforementioned draft we talked about. Is a very good player. Just we were talking about in comparison to Cal McCarr. You probably pick Cal McCord to build your team around. No offense to Nico, but um, Nico <laughs> is a great player, captain, natural born leader. Obviously, now if he can, the only thing with Nico this year is stay healthy. And, yeah, availability. Uh, he's already the captain. He's already a leader. Everybody already loves him in the locker room. If he can stay healthy, he had five goals, one assist, also six points. 
um, and went absolutely ballistic for a Devils team that doesn't have a lot of good things to talk about this year. Neither do the Blue Jackets, so it's good to see both of their players get put in the three stars of the week. And then, obviously, Jacob Markstrom has a lot to talk about. He's one of the Vezina candidates. Yeah, right. Uh, continues mm-hmm. to have a season. So. so, Joe, quick question here for you. Any word on the Major League Baseball lockout? There's been little, but it's more – the union submit like Manfred had that stupid press conference that nobody really cared about because it was Rob Manfred having a press conference that everybody thought he should have had weekly that he decided to have months into the lockout on a state of the union of the lockout, um, which was him basically lying about how great the deal was for players now compared to how it was before, which like, well, it was better before, but it was like, okay, you get paid $1,500 per month. I'm now going to pay you, two thousand dollars a month which is great but it's like in hindsight they want players to feel like they get more they don't get held down by arbitration as much where it's like well i'm so good and then i have this arbitration period where these guys are getting paid where they should be getting paid equal to that to their stats i have the same stats as them and i'm getting paid so little because i'm still in this arbor so they're trying to fix that stuff, they didn't like the economics. I saw the last thing I read from the Players Association still didn't like what the um, okay. league Okay. Said. I, I think it's more at this point on the owners to realize, like, yes, the players, as some people say on social media, I mean, they are really rich, but these owners are multi-billion dollar. Like, they, they're the ones that, if, you, if you're saying anybody's trying to gouge, it's them. Because they don't need more money. But, like... Like, nobody that's a multi – where some of these players that are asking for more money are not the – none of them are the Bryce Harpers of the world, which that's the people that that bring up the average that 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 unfortunately allow the owners to say, well, the average annual salary is $4 million. Well, no flying crap to natural average because you have Bryce, you have Bryce Harper getting paid. You got guys that are making $12, 13 million dollars a year. And then you have Trout almost getting paid half a billion dollars. So obviously, <laughs> your average annual salaries like that's not a way to look at it at all. Yeah, exactly. Like, so like, um, like that's why I think there's a disconnect there where they need to have it. If they they made it a little bit better. For players to get better, they didn't. The Manfred kind of talked around it, so we didn't know the exact details. But a little bit better, so they got more money sooner. But not nearly enough. It was like a little bit of an increase, like a very small increase. Yeah. That, so like they need to do something more for guys Same. that are great. Like obviously, like the teachers of the world, they got paid by the Padres. But if he didn't get paid by the Padres, he would still be sitting there with arbitration. <laughs> uh, as as you have other short stats that aren't even as good as Fernando Tatis, but are still really good all star level that get paid because they're done their arbitration. Exactly. So like that's what, like the like, like Correa is really good, but with the way Tatis is playing, when all is said and done, Tatis is probably going to be better if he stays healthy than Carlos Correa because of the, of him already being as good as Carlos Correa when he first came onto the league and he's only been in the league for a couple seasons. So okay. um, like I think they have to balance that out. Uh, I think right in my opinion because I've listened to a lot of stuff from the compound podcast and different podcasts that have players on a Chris Rose's rotation. The players have also said where Manfred tries to say like, Oh, well it's a, it's like a two way street. You have to pick up the phone where that's not true. That's him trying to cover his own behind because the players were saying around Christmas, the league wouldn't talk to them. It was that they were trying to play the silent treatment. So they would then negotiate against themselves. So that's on you for deciding to, not talk for a period of time you can't say well they could have picked up the phone yeah they could have picked up the phone it probably Mm -hmm. wouldn't have been a fun conversation for you because you told them to basically buzz off so if someone picked up the phone it probably would have been you getting ripped apart (laughs) yeah probably of that person going you better blah 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 and then every single thing if they played that three spn the second word would have been blocked out as some player that is (laughs) players you is cursing out rob manfred on the phone so it wouldn't have been a fun conversation for Rob okay. Man for that conversation did go down, Rob. I just wanted to get an update on kind of where you thought things were going and where we were at and everything like that. And it's a real shame that, you know, baseball can't seem to figure it out because every time they do this, they just lose more and more people. And it's not like they can afford to lose anymore. Well, baseball Trevor Blue also and, put out um one of the people that works for John Boy Media, Trevor Plouffe, a former third baseman, he played for the Phillies for a minute. 
um, also the Minnesota Twins was his best years. But uh, he put out that on his baseball team, only two guys on his team knew of when he said, who's your favorite player, knew of anyone. So, like, nowadays, some of these kids are kind of just playing it for this activity type, where that just goes to show where the people that say baseball's marketing sucks, they're absolutely right, because they're not marketing to any of the younger uh, generation nowadays. And they're getting lost in translation, not in translation, but they're getting lost in the abyss, basically, uh, just because now they're in a lockout at the worst time. Um, They struggle to get back before the lockout in the COVID season when the NHL didn't only get back, but extended their CBA during trying to get back. So, like, the, 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 there's all these different things that just point in baseball being... Oh, they also extended plus. their TV contracts as well, too, NHL. Yeah, they also got well, new TV contracts with two bigger networks. Than yeah, ESPN and TNT. With ESPN and TNT. So, yeah, so, yeah, they did a billion things. They can't even do one main thing, which is get their star sport to actually play. So. Hey man, if you guys need any lessons, uh, call up the NHL. I'm sure they'll be happy to uh, show you guys how to get it done. Well, uh, Joe, what do you think, man? I think we got another good one here. Why don't you tell the folks where they can read all your great articles? Number one, um, especially about the Reading Royals, uh, where they can find you all your Flyers nitty gritty stuff with the Phantoms and the Flyers, and where they can catch you, reach you, and follow you, sir. You can follow me at uh, JJBorg26 on Twitter. Um, you can also find my stuff on obviously steelflyers.com, flyersnittygritty.com. I uh, do stuff for the Reading Royals, Lehigh Valley Phantoms, and do some Philadelphia Flyers stuff as well. Um, uh, obviously, we had a great show for you recapping the Super Bowl. Some other NFL stuff. We went over a lot of NHL stuff for you in this one. Um, and next week's, we'll talk about the Olympics because that'll be after the the woman's gold medal game and then we'll have more to talk yeah. about with hockey there yeah, so sure. we'll get into that next week that's for sure um as we recap some of those games but i hope everybody enjoyed this show stay safe out there everybody and enjoy the hockey and enjoy the basketball as now the football season's over as congratulations again to the la rams on being champions yeah man for sure congratulations to the rams um so sad for the cincinnati Bengals. Um, hopefully Tyler Toffoli will have a good season. Uh, welcome back, Jack Eichel, uh, to the ice and hopefully everything goes well for him as well, too. So thanks everybody for watching. You can find me on Twitter at steel 52. You can also find me out on the web at www.steelflyers.com. Check us out, hit the like and subscribe, and we will catch you all the next time on the JB and steel show.